Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on selecting a rotation method in a factor analysis in SPSS. Oftentimes in counseling research, we want to reduce a number of items, for example, from a psychometric test into clearly defined factors, and we use factor analysis to accomplish this goal. And part of identifying and defining factors is to use what's referred to as a rotation. So first let's take a look at these fictitious data I have in the SPSS statistics data editor. You can see I have 10 variables, item 1, item 2, all the way through item 10, and the values in each cell, in each record, range between 1 and 5. So if you see here for record 1, item 1 is a 5, item 2 is a 1, item 3 is a 4, and so on. And we could think of these as responses to an individual item on a psychometric assessment, perhaps a Likert scale, where 1 represents strongly disagree and 5 represents strongly agree. So to get started with selecting a rotation method, I'm going to start the factor analysis procedure for these 10 items. So I'm going to go to Analyze, Dimension Reduction, Factor, and this is what the factor analysis dialog looks like by default. Over here in the list box on the left, I'm going to hit Control A and select items 1 through 10 and move them over to the variables list box. Of interest here, of course, is the rotation, but I'm going to take a look at these other options first. Under descriptives, I'm just going to add coefficients, determinant, and KMO in Bartlett's test of sphericity, and the univariate descriptives as well. Under extraction, I'm just going to add the scree plot. I'm going to make no other changes here. Under scores, there'll be no changes. And under options, I'm going to, under uh, this frame, coefficient display format, I'm going to change this to sorted by size. This is an important checkbox, sorted by size. And then continue. And now let's take a look under rotation. So we can see under the method here, uh, you can have no rotation, you can have Verimax, Quartermax, or Equimax. These three methods are called orthogonal rotations. And we use these when we believe that the factors that we're going to be extracting are uncorrelated. And then you have direct oblimin and Promax. And these are considered oblique rotations. And we would use these when the factors are correlated. So before I start the process of selecting a rotation, I want to explain what a rotation is. We can think of a rotation in a factor analysis as a mathematical procedure that rotates the factor axes in order to produce results that are more interpretable. So it makes the loading patterns more clear, easier to identify, more pronounced. The whole purpose of rotation is to create what's called the simple structure. And the simple structure, if it's achieved through rotation, will be easy to interpret. So that's the goal. So the goal of rotation is to obtain a simple structure that can be interpreted so that we can make sense of the factor loadings. So how do we go about in selecting a rotation method? As I mentioned, we have Verimax, Quartermax, and Equimax. And we assume here for these three rotations that the factors in the analysis are uncorrelated and direct oblimin and Promax are oblique rotations and we assume for these, the factors are correlated. So first, we need to determine if the factors are uncorrelated or correlated, so we know if we would select 
an orthogonal method or an oblique method. Orthogonal rotation or oblique rotation. So first I'm going to go to direct oblimin, which is an oblique rotation method. And I'm just going to leave display set to rotated solution and leave the maximum iterations for convergence set to 25. Click continue and then click OK. Now we have a lot of output that's generated here by SPSS in this example, but for the purposes of this video I'm just trying to determine what rotation would be the most useful for us given this particular set of data. So here I'm going to move down all the way to the end of this output and I'm looking for the component correlation matrix. And what I'm looking for here specifically in the component correlation matrix is any correlation between the factors or components that is greater than 0.32 or less than negative 0.32. So another way of considering this would be we're looking for any value here that if we take the absolute value we have exceeded 0.32. Now of course we're going to exclude the components correlation with itself. That's always going to be 1. So you can see we have the 1's that run diagonally. We're going to exclude those. And if we take a look at the other values we can see here there's no other values. If we take the absolute value it would exceed 0.32. If we did have a value that exceeded 0.32 we would use an oblique rotation. So that would be either direct oblimin or Promax. Either one of those rotations would work in that case. In this case, since none of the absolute values exceed 0.32, we're going to use an orthogonal rotation. So I'm going to go back to Analyze, Dimension Reduction, Factor, and this is going to save all the settings from the previous factor analysis, so I just need to go into Rotation, and for the orthogonal rotation methods, I have the choice of Verimax, Quartermax, or Equimax. I'm going to use Verimax. So I'm just going to change from Direct Oblimin to Verimax and click Continue, and then click OK. So again, there is a significant quantity of output here. So I'm going to move down to the rotated component matrix. That's what I'm interested in, the rotated component matrix. And I'm going to be examining this matrix to see if it qualifies as having a simple structure. Now there are a great variety of definitions for simple structure. But in general, there's just a few things that we're looking for here. What we like to see is, for example, here with component 1 and item 10, item 8, we want to see significant loadings on one component. In this case, we have 0.83 for item 10 and 0.798 for item 8. And then we want to see as many zero loadings for the other components as possible, knowing that we're not going to have entirely zero components in most cases. Now, a zero component can be roughly defined as any factor loading that is greater than negative 0.1 and less than 0.1. We also want to keep an eye out for significant loadings. And again, there are many opinions about what's a significant loading and what is not a significant loading. Any loading greater than 0.3 could be considered significant, but it's not unusual for researchers to use 0.4 or 0.45. And at the same time, we want to be on the lookout for complex variables. In this case, our variables are items. So we'd be looking for items that have a loading of 0.3 or greater on two or more factors. That would be a complex variable. So with those guidelines in mind, let's take a look at the rotated component matrix. 
And you can see here, if we look at item 10 and item 8, again, they have strong loadings. So they, they seem to be loading together. They seem to represent a component. And we can see we have zero loadings here on component 2, uh, zero loading here on component 3 for item 8, but not for item 10, and the same result for uh, component 4. A zero loading for item 8, but not for item 10. But neither one of these items represents a complex variable because we have a significant loading here for component 1, but no other significant loadings. No other factor loadings that exceed 0.3. So now let's move to component 2. And we can see we have strong factor loadings here for item 5 and item 6. So they appear to be holding together as a factor. And we have several zero loadings, but then we have a few instances where we do not have zero loadings here at point 154 and component 3 for item 5, and again for component 1 on item 6 at point 21. Then moving on to component 3, we can see that component 3 appears to have item 1, item 2, and item 9, 0 0.836, 0 0.725, and 0.469. We only have one zero loading for item 1, and that's on component 2, and we have two that violate the zero loading rule, so they do not count as zero loadings. For item 2, we have two zero loadings, but then we have, for component 1, a factor loading of 0.8. 302. So this means that item 2 is a complex variable. It has a factor loading of 0.725 on component 3 and 0.302 on component 1. And then for item 9, again we have 0.469 for component 3, two zero loadings, and then a not zero loading on component 2 of 0.146. And again, for the last component, we just follow the same process. We can see we have two zero loadings for item four, one non-zero loading. For item three, we have a non-zero loading here, negative 1.35, and then we also have a value of 0.371. So again, item three is going to be another complex variable. Then we have a zero loading, and of course the 0.649, which we would consider to be indicative of where this item loads. So we believe that item 4, 3, and 7 all load on factor 4. And then for item 7, we have two non-zero loadings here, and then one zero loading, 0 0.093, and then 0.595, and again we, we believe these are grouped together. So 4, 3, and 7 appear to be grouped together on factor 4. Item 1, item 2, and item 9 appear to be grouped together on factor 3. Item 5 and 6 appear to be grouped together on factor 2, and item, items 10 and 8 appear to group, be grouped together on factor 1. So this is with a Verimax rotation. So if we went back into Analyze, Dimension Reduction Factor, and switch this rotation to another orthogonal rotation, let's go with Quartermax and click Continue, and then OK. I'm going to take the table we were just looking at, which is the rotated component matrix. So we can see in this last factor analysis with quarter max, we can see the rotated component matrix. So I'm going to take the rotated component matrix from the other analysis and kind of move that down a bit. And here you see we have the rotated component matrix that I was just looking at, the Verimax, and now we have the Quartermax. So we can compare them one on top of the other. And we can see that the results are very close. Items 10 and 8 are together here. Items 5 and 6 are together here. For factor 3, we have items 1, 2, and 9, just as we would with the Verimax. And then items 4, 3, and 7 hold together. And again, the factor loadings in the quarter max rotated component matrix are identical 
or very close to the factor loadings in the Veramax rotation, in the rotated component matrix for the Veramax rotation. So let's go back in and take a look at the last orthogonal rotation, and that would be the Equimax. And again, I'm going to arrange this output so we can see these tables uh, near one another. So I've arranged it so the Veramax is on top, then we have Quartermax, and then Equimax here at the end. And again, you can see all the values are either identical or very close with the Equimax rotation to the factor loadings that we see in the Quartermax and the Veramax rotations. And the conclusions we would draw would be the same. Items 10 and 8 together, 5 and 6 together, 1, 2, and 9 together, and 4, 3, and 7 appear to load together. Now in terms of which rotation you want to interpret, or which rotation you want to use to assist in the interpretation of the factor analysis, in this case these are pretty close to the same. For this particular fictitious data set, there's really not much difference between any of the orthogonal rotations. If there were a difference between them of any note, you'd want to select the rotation that brought you the closest to the simple structure. So again, you'd be looking for the rotation that has the fewest number of complex variables or no complex variables and for the rotation that provided zero loadings on factors where there was not a significant loading. I hope you found this video on selecting rotation for factor analysis in SPSS to be useful. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to assist you.